at the risk of sounding glib, uh, I, I think the first thing I would say is there's never been a better time to be diagnosed with CLL. Um, I mean, I've been working on this for 20 odd years now, and I've, I've never been more hopeful for the future for CLL patients, really, that the advances that have been made both in terms of our understanding of the biology, but also then how we've translated that through into developing really smart therapeutics has been incredibly exciting and, and really inspirational for the likes of me, um, you know, working in this field. It, it, give, it spurs us on. It makes us feel that we are actually making forward motion with this, with this illness. Um, and as, again, as you probably have heard, you know, there are a number of new drugs currently in clinical development um, ibrutinib and adelalisib, I can actually say that word now, um, it, which really target molecules expressed by the B cells that are showing remarkable clinical efficacy with really very, very good side effect profiles. So patients won't be getting so sick anymore when they actually have to come to treatment. So we're abandoning chemotherapy basically. We're not quite at the point where we're going to abandon it completely, but I, I predict very strongly that over the next five years, chemo will be a thing of the past for CLL patients. And that's a really exciting thing to say. It's been a preoccupation of doctors ever since they've been treating patients with all sorts of conditions, let alone cancer, trying to get their proverbial crystal ball out and say to each individual patient, look, this is how I see the future for you. This is how I think your, your disease is going to develop or progress or stay remarkably stable. And of course, that knowledge, the surety of that knowledge is really important to patients and their families. We can't overestimate, I think, the amount of importance that the individuals place on having some certainty about at least their short-term future. So what does the future hold for me as an individual? So what we've been doing over the last sort of 10 years-ish working on prognostic markers is to try to um, use more sophisticated algorithms to, to be able to predict for individual patients how the disease will behave. And we've made quite a lot of progress in that regard, not just our group here, but globally there's been a preoccupation for this. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of prognostic markers. Um, but our paper two years ago really did set a new benchmark, I think, because what we decided to do was to just look at stage A patients. So patients who are newly diagnosed, so not patients who had already progressed. We looked at markers, the existing markers, and how they performed at predicting clinical outcome for individuals at diagnosis. And what we determined really was that all of these fancy down markers that we developed over the years really didn't um, give pa pa patients an awful lot of surety about their future. The, in fact, the, the prognostic marker that came out as being the strongest predictor of time to first treatment um, was, in fact, lymphocyte doubling time, which is a very old-fashioned, old-school clinical parameter, basically monitoring the white blood cell count of the patient and seeing whether the cells expanded or didn't over a particular unit time. Um, so as you might imagine, the world of CLL didn't really like that very much um, because we've all invested large sums of money and an awful lot of time trying to develop more sophisticated markers than that. In terms of overall survival, unmutated immunoglobulin genes still held up. And so I would argue that at this present moment, the strongest prognostic marker that we have is immunoglobulin gene uh, mutational status. Um, but that is changing. I mean, we've just published a paper only last month, basically showing that the specialized structures at the ends of chromosomes um, called telomeres actually give even greater prognostic surety for individual patients. And the reason why I can say that uh, to you is that we've we've actually looked at over 400 patients now in this regard and so statistically um, we're, pre we're on pretty solid ground but the, the remarkable thing about the telomere measurement compared to all the other markers including immunoglobulin gene status is that we can predict those patients who 
really have an incredibly good prognosis. So in terms of Kaplan-Meier curves, which are you know, survival curves, the superior curve, the, i.e. those patients who do best, is almost a flat line with long telomeres. So if you've got long telomeres, you're going to survive. It's as simple as that. And we've never had a marker like that before.